the Unseen World of the Bible, Session 9, titled Holy War, 4th of December 2022. Now, there is a religion in the world that has made Holy War one of its fundamental doctrines. Do uh, Christians involved in Holy War? Yes. Back when there was very little biblical knowledge in Europe, by the end of this session, I hope that you and I will better be able to explain Yahweh's purpose for Israel in the land, that is, the, the Holy Land. Secondly, why Israel wiped out some cities, that is. Then thirdly, why Yahweh would become human, would have become human himself. The theme of the lesson is given to us on page 95 of the book. The conquest of the promised land was a holy war against the forces of darkness and enemies under the dominion of hostile gods. The Bible says are real spiritual entities. So there is a real war going on between real living beings, even if we can't see them all the time. Now, if you've ever been involved in Christian work in a less Christian part of the world, you come to realize that how quickly spiritual warfare turns physical. Uh, one of the themes of the scripture, First Testament itself, is how rebellious Israel has been down through the centuries and the millennium. And this proved early in the life of the people after their exodus from Egypt. The people complained about their hardships in the hearing of the Lord, and when he heard them, his anger was aroused. What kind of hardships were they? Right. Well, eating the same thing. Yeah. Even though it was free, tasty yes. food that was provided every morning, they got tired of it. Uh, when the water was getting low, they began complaining that Moses had brought them out in the wilderness to let them die. Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his wife. For he had married a Goshen. Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They asked. Africans are amongst some of the most beautiful people in the world, physically, mm -hmm. and quite often in character. Here's another problem. The promised land to which they were going at that time was occupied by foreign gods. After the start of Israel's journey, this message came. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites and I will wipe them out. Do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. The translation says wipe them out. Could have said get rid of them or dispel them. Who is it? The angel. It's the angel who's going to do it. And what did we learn in previous lesson? Why the scripture often refers to Yahweh God as an angel. In fact, he himself will say, I send my angel. It's my angel. So is he talking? Person himself, first person? Yes. Because I read my angel at first, it comes out as he's sending an angel. Well, he did send an angel, just as he sent Jesus into the world. That was Yahweh himself who came. In the first testament, when he sent his angel, that was he himself in the form of a spiritual <coughs> intermediary. Remember, he created all of this, so yes. he, can, he can do that. I'm going to get rid of the people. What are you to do? Following. Yeah, make sure you do not worship any of those gods. Because that's why they're wiped out. Yes, there's the twofold problem. You have those who obey false gods and the false gods themselves who are ruling over the promised land. And that rule must be broken. Before the end of their journey, as they were entering the land, this message came. When you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. First glance of my oh, it just, just means the, the sun, the moon, and the stars. But if we read on in the verse, uh, the things in the heaven include more than the visible asters. The very beings, spiritual beings, angel, angels if you wish, to whom he had apportioned the nation. You will be enticed, do not give in. But there was a further problem. Uh, there was a long history amongst the Israelites of the Nephilim. Afraid of the Nephilim, Israel refused to enter Canaan, the promised land. And so we know the story of the spies who were sent in, 
who came back, gave the report. First, who were the Nephilim? Those were the offspring of the ones that the divine <coughs> council members right. made it with human women. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. The Greek Bible translated this term Nephilim as giants. We move through biblical history, we find that there were lineages, clans if you wish, of giantess persons who were opposed violently against Israel and were insulting towards their God, Yahweh. So this is a theme of scripture. This does not necessarily mean that some of those Nephilim survived through the flood, but any giantess race that was set against the Israelites and against Yahweh were called Nephilim. So here's what happened then when the spies went into the land and came back and gave their report. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Here's one of those places where a later editor seems to have put something into the text to explain to us the Anakim, or the, the Anakites, as some translations say. But this is what they thought they saw. <clears throat> hey, the Nephilim are in the land. But we're given this note that descended from the tribe of Anak. We felt like grasshoppers. We felt so small. And when they saw us, they looked at us the same way. So what is this report trying to accomplish? What's its effect upon those who hear it? Here. I don't know. Have you ever been in a fight with somebody who was two feet bigger and a foot wider than you? <laughs> it also used to kind of try and separate, separate the Israelites from God. The decision then was, we're not going. And they did not go. Yahweh ordered Israel eventually to dispossess the Canaanites. Now, those who despise Christianity often cite the massacres for everybody in Canaan. And so the picture that is normally portrayed to us is that the Israelites went city after city and wiped out everybody, men, women, and children. Is that what happened? Well, after the start of Israel's journey, cross the Jordan into Canaan, drive out all the inhabitants of the land before. What was the command? Drive them out. Let them leave. Put them under pressure, military pressure. Let also the fear of Yahweh come upon them. Remember the inhabitants of Jericho, they had heard what Yahweh had done for the Israelites, bringing them out of Egypt, and they were really afraid that here was a God more powerful than their own. But the command was, let them go. And then do what else? Destroy all their carved images and their cast idols and demolish all their high places. Why would that be important? If the people have left, why don't we just keep their idols around as Artifacts. Because it's temptation. A temptation, okay, to do what? To worship the idols. Why would they want to uh, use idols? Because in physical they can see it. That's true, but there's also what you believe, that they do to be true about idols. That they were gods. Well, that gods inhabit the idols. In fact, there are ancient ceremonies that you can read in the cuneiform tablets that describe <laughs> how when you make an idol, give it eyes, you give it a mouth, and you give it ears, and then there's a ceremony whereby the gods are invited to come down into the idol and they go in through the mouth. Those of you who have traveled in parts of the world where idolatry is still quite public, you know that that's the common belief to this day. The idol is nothing but a statue. It's the spirit who comes and inhabits it with whom you can speak, or to whom you can speak, even if it never replies. And so the warning here is, do not become involved with the gods that rule over that territory. Destroy the idols and let them leave. Now then, Yahweh also ordered Israel to dispossess the Canaanites. The Lord will drive out all these nations before you, and you will dispossess nations larger and stronger than you. The Lord was to drive them out, and we would dispossess them. That is, we would move into their cities. The land then would be occupied by those who worship Yahweh, and Yahweh would be the deity over the promised land so that he could develop a people 
through whom to bless the very nations whom they've chased out. And eventually Jesus would say, go make disciples of all those nations. And a further promise, every place where you set your foot will be yours. That's what happened. Wherever they went, the Lord gave them success with a few missteps. missteps. However, Israel was to exterminate cities that resisted. Those populations who said, we will not go, we will not submit to your Yahweh, we have our own gods, and our own gods claim this land, and we serve them. And so when a people said, what, we're not leaving, the Israelites said, all right, we could use you for fertilizer. It was Yahweh himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy. There were certain clans that Yahweh knew should not be allowed to leave and to go establish themselves in other territories because of their strong association with the powers of darkness, especially those who were the descendants of Anak, called Nephilim. They annihilated with the sword everything that breathed in the city, including men and women, young and old. Yet Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and all who belonged to her. The population of Jericho resisted and was wiped out. However, there were some exceptions. And you know the story of Rahab, how she had protected the spies from Israel and acknowledged that your God, Yahweh, he must be the true God. We've heard his reputation. Please remember me and my family when you come occupy our city. Whom does that remind you of the New Testament? Sir, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Amen. Remember how the Yahweh promised to drive out pagan peoples. There is ancient artwork depicting many of the very peoples who are mentioned in the Bible. Send a angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, 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 and Jebusites. I will send an angel. Earlier he said, I will send my angel to drive them out. I will drive out before you the Amorites, Canaanites, Hittites, Hesizites, and Jebusites. Jebusites, by the way, were the occupants of Jerusalem. Why did I give you two verses that say essentially the same thing? There's that parallel again. I was, it's the angel does it, or I do it. The Lord can speak of himself in either way, as the angel or as myself. The folk still were quite afraid. You may say to yourselves, these nations are stronger than we are. How can we drive them out? But do not be afraid of them. Remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. All the adults alive at that time should have remembered what God had done. What had God done, that is Yahweh, in Egypt for these very people who were afraid? Ten plagues. The ten plagues against all the gods of Egypt. Destroyed the firstborn. Destroyed Pharaoh's army. Took a few generations to recuperate. Archaeologists are still finding Egyptian paraphernalia in their digs inside of Israel and the surrounding nations. The ten plagues, you got that right. The Nile was poisoned at one point, and one of the primary functions of Pharaoh was to ensure that the Nile River flooded every year so they could grow their crops and live. So when the Nile itself turned poison, probably even the color red, this was an assault against their god, Pharaoh. So if God was able to do that with the major gods of the region and the major political power of the region, could he not do that with little pagan cities? Well, here's what happened then. Israel exterminated the Nephilim enemies, especially those associated with a king named Sion. Sion did not permit Israel to pass through his border. He fought against Israel. He and his people were opposed to the arrival of this new ethnic group. They should have been welcomed as new business, trading partners, lots of beautiful girls to be married off, and herds that could be procured through, through trade or raiding. But no, they did not want the intrusion of this people and their God. So here's what happened. When Sihon and all his army came out to meet us in battle at Jahaz, the Lord our God delivered him over to us, and we struck him down, together with his sons and his whole army. At that time, we took all his towns and completely destroyed them. 
men, women, and children. We left no survivors. So here was a, apparently a complete massacre. But again, it was against the people who had taken stand against Israel and their God Yahweh. Is it dangerous to take a stand against the God of the Bible? Yes. <laughs> it is. Well, then there was King Hall, through whom the plot gets even thicker. King Og of Bashan and all his forces marched out against them to do battle at Edri. King of Bashan. What do you know about Bashan? Not only by it, it's bigger than Mount Hermon, includes Mount Hermon. Sorry, was that Goliath's hometown? The Lord our God also gave into our hand Og, king of Bashan, and all his army. We struck them down to leave no survivors. At that time, we took all the cities and completely destroyed them as we had done with the king of Hezbon. Every city, men, women, and children. Who was King Paul? What do we know about him and his people? All right, Jack, read that aloud. We took from these two kings of the Amorites the territory east of the Jordan, from the Arnon Gorge as far as Mount Hermon. We took all the towns on the plateau and all Bashan as far as towns of Og's kingdom in Bashan. Og, king of Bashan, was the last of the Ars. The Rephaites or the Rephaim? What do we know about the Rephites? Well, the Rephaim and the Anakim were both considered to be Nephilim clans or tribes. They were associated with the region of Bashan. Bashan, by the way, includes the Golan Heights to this day, which is still contested by the pagan gods and the god of Israel. Considered to be, those are high mountains, snowy mountains, where human beings could not dwell. They were too high, too cold, too snowy, and therefore were considered widely to be the homeland of the pagan gods of the nations surrounding them. So if you wanted to meet the gods themselves, you went to Bashan. And one of the mountains in the Bashan range that was low enough to get to the top of was Mount Hermon, which apparently is where Jesus met with his disciples and commissioned them. So we have Mount Hermon, the region of Bashan, and the Nephilim, Rephites, all mentioned in the same verse. And eventually we're going to try to make a case that that's all related. Then we have this further note about all. His bed, sarcophagus, was decorated with iron and was more than nine cubits long and four cubits wide. In modern measurements, what, what is a cubit? 18 inches is a cubit. 18 inches. Okay. So the sarcophagus was quite long and quite wide. Normally, when you open a sarcophagus, what do you normally find inside? The remains. Before you get to the remains, <laughs> there's the casket and often other objects. So the sarcophagus had to be big enough for, the, for all of that. And then inside the casket would be the mummy. Because they believed in the next world, you get to take that stuff with you. And so, and if you were young enough, you put toys in there so you have something to play with. <laughs> you ever wonder why they bothered to mention his bed? Kind of like a trite thing to say. Researchers have found out, well, often that's what the sarcophagus was called in the pagan languages, the final bed. And he probably was a pretty tall guy, maybe quite a physically big. It was decorated with iron. Here's an example of an actual old sarcophagus of large dimensions painted with red color. It was red color because the paint was made with iron. The point in here is not the bed he used to sleep on, his forever bed. When we were finished with him, he was put away in the sarcophagus. Is the God of the Bible evil or murderous? By what standard? Well, in those first verses, he was just, the ones that didn't resist, he just had to get them out of there. The ones that resisted and refused. God is righteous. Well, the association of evil and murder is, is what he dealt justice or judgment on mm -hmm. those who committed evil or were murderers. When any people would resist the Israelites, they were saying, in essence, our God is bigger than your God. Our God will protect us, we're staying here. And it costed them everything. So here's the question that's sometimes posed. How could a moral God command the slaughter of entire cities of men, women, and their children? Seems to me your God is immoral. Since immoral gods do not exist, your God does not exist. And we are morally superior to you Christians, 
We don't do that. I'd like to know who's asking the question besides myself. The book, I had that question. <laughs> What's the <laughs> way? Would God want to wipe all these people out? Well, he first he didn't want to. He, might, he would have preferred that they leave because eventually he knew that he was going to reach those nations with the gospel. Otherwise, he had to get their gods out of the land. So when somebody asks a question like this, first I want to know, do you advocate for free abortion? No, you don't. But if you're <laughs> insulting my God, I want to know, do you do the same thing that you're accusing God of doing? Uh, or do you argue for sterilization by vaccine? You know, the richest man in the world has done that. And then you're also directly against you know, the sterilization part because God told us to, to go out and be fruitful. Everyone who is talking depopulation is taking their stand against the God who commanded humans to multiply and build the earth. And we haven't quite done that yet, even though we are quite wasteful of much of the resources around us. Uh, do you support military action overseas, those who are killing Russian boys thousands by, by the thousands a day, who don't even have clean socks to wear? Or are you a theist, that is a God believer, who is embarrassed or perplexed by such biblical passage? Well, here are some things to think about. From my mind, I'd like your reaction as well. First, we noted in the text that God had given the Canaanites 400 years to repent. When he sent Israel into Egypt to learn how to survive under foreign gods, he said, the sins of the Amorites have not yet reached their, their fullness. So there's God's 100 years, yeah. that's a long time to have to change. That's patience. These peoples themselves practiced infanticide and genocide. When they went to war, they would wipe out entire populations. And we know that some of their gods demanded child sacrifice. Are they okay? They were given an opportunity to emigrate, leave the land. But then only giant Nephilim clans who chose to oppose Yahweh were annihilated, exterminated. Then Yahweh's aim was to bless all nations through Israel living in the land under Yahweh's rule. Well, I, I think the point about um, terminating the bloodline of the Nephilim, was, that was enlightening to me. God is creator and holds everybody's life in his hands anyway. Right. You just got to wait. You could never murder. That would be the unlawful taking of life. Right. Well, I wasn't that with the divine council mating with human daughters. Wasn't wasn't that their plan was to create a master race? And of course, we have very wealthy industrialists at this time in the 21st century who have their own plans in place to replace a large part of the world's population with what they're calling transhumans. Not trans men, trans women, trans humans, who will be half technology and possibly half human. Sci-fi. Yahweh knew in advance that Israel would fail at this task. So why did he send them? The Lord said to Moses, you are going to rest with your ancestors, and these people will soon prostitute themselves to the foreign gods of the land they are entering. They will forsake me and break the covenant I made with them. Does God know the future? Yeah. 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 Is it because he causes the future? No, I don't answer that. <laughs> He's from everlasting to everlasting, and so he knows the beginning and the end. He can experience them all at the same time, and he is definitely a master chess player. He always wins. He knew that Israel would fail at the task, but that was also part of the plan. Well, there's, there's parts to the Old Testament where, where they were told not to take foreign brides or concubines because they would corrupt them. Even King Solomon, towards the end of his life, became corrupt. He did three things that God had forbidden, that a king should multiply gold, multiply horses, and multiply wives. Money, military, and wives. And marriage. The plan was to get Israel into the land with Yahweh as their primary God because of what he intended to do. At the same time, it was Yahweh who gave victory to Israel. I destroyed the Amorites before them, though they were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed their fruit above and the roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. Whatever success was obtained was by Yahweh's own intervention. 
Were these Amorites really as tall as a cedar tree? Our neighbors have a cedar tree. I wouldn't want to fall out of it. Ours is big too. Yeah. Uh, is that what the Bible saying? These guys are 40, 50, 60 feet tall? No. Bigger dust. I guess it would be at least seven feet. Well, when you compare a cedar to many of the indigenous trees of the region, it's the tallest. All right. Now, Israel had a threefold task to accomplish. Here's what they were told to do. First, then, was to chase enemy nations out of Canaan. What was the second thing they were to do? Destroy the uh, statues and idols. Yes, that's number three. This was as foreign gods from the land. And along the way, to exterminate the Nephilim lineages, or the uh, bloodline and some. So if they exterminated those Nephilim, what would prevent the sons of God from coming back and starting to open over again? In fact, are they doing so? Just how busy are the sons of God towards the end of this age, trying once again to raise yeah. up a mixed race of some kind? possibly under the guise of transhumanism, possibly under the guise of extraterrestrials. I could imagine if they can create a new kind of mixed race, that they would pretend that they have come from a far planet in another galaxy and arrive in silver disks and come down onto the green grass. Well, in the movies, it has to be uh, the White House. <laughs> in Europe, it would be Brussels. In China, it would be Beijing. I don't believe it, but it's fun to talk about. Israel, in fact, did obey Yahweh, partially. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did they did any survive. Right. They did a pretty good job of wiping out the Anakim, but not a complete job. And will these uh, surviving Anakites be any problem to Israel later on? Yes. yes. <laughs> when Joshua, Joshua had grown old, Yahweh said to him, There are still very large areas of land to be taken over. Five Philistine rulers from Baal, Gad, below Mount Hermon, to Lebo Hamath. The job was not done. Joshua hadn't quite finished the conquest. The Philistine rulers were going to continue to be a big problem, including the surviving Anakim Nephilim. Uh, and they were mentioned here of a place called Baal God, near Mount Hermon. Keep that in mind. We're going to come back to Baal and Mount Hermon later on. And the Nephilim lineages did continue to plague Israel for a time. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. Well, we know from other scriptures that Goliath and his brothers were apparently of that, that bloodline, and they challenged Israel. This guy was so big and so strong and so intimidating, nobody wanted to engage him in that, except whom? David. David. King David, David yeah. Who was a young man, not nearly as big as Goliath, but what, what was David's two assets that led to his success? He had Yahweh God on his side, and secondly, he was good with a sling. <laughs> <laughs> What's the advantage of a sling over a sword? It doesn't have to get that close. At Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. These were descendants in Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. So um, these are descendants of Raphaim, like the Anakim, and so David and his men finished the job, so to speak. By the way, how tall was Goliath? What does your Bible say? Nine feet and one. That's six cubits. Here's the fascinating thing about our Bible. Nobody really knows exactly what it originally said. <laughs> the Hebrew Bible, as has come down to us since the 10th century AD, does read six cubits in a span, span being a half a cubit, so about nine feet nine inches, or just about three meters tall. And that's what Christians believed for centuries. However, those who had access to older translations of the Bible realized that the Greek Bible, that is the Septuagint, of which we have copies from the fourth century AD, in contrast with the oldest Hebrew Bibles of 10th century AD, said something else. He was near to seven feet tall. So the LXX means Greek Septuagint version. 
And from the mid 20th century, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls near Qumran, there's a copy of the text which says the same as the Greek Bible. So the Greek Bible was not a mistake, it was a translation of the Hebrew text as it existed, at least one lineage of the Hebrew text as it existed before the time of Jesus. Exaggeration even in the old days. Maybe the average height of a man in the period was maybe about five feet. So if Goliath was closer to seven feet tall, he's still big, he's still tall, he's still strong. You were not going to go up against him in fisticuffs or in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So Yahweh would himself have to complete the task. This is part of the plan. To get this job done, well, we're just going to jump ahead now and give a little uh, theology. But he would become a human being and an Israelite human being. Just as he had sent his angel, he would now send his king, Messiah. The Messiah would lead a life of obedience to the law of God, Torah, if you will, constantly listening to the Father and doing what the Father commanded him to do. He would fulfill the old covenants inaugurating the new covenant. So when we took communion this morning, we held up the cup, and what did Pastor say? Covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. And he would die to take away human sins, thereby forming a new humanity made of both Jews and Gentiles, thereby disempowering the gods. The holy war we are involved in is this. It is to win fellow human beings through faith in the God of the Bible, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we are born again, we come into his body, the church, and the gods lose all rule and authority over us. The only thing they have left is deceit. If they can lie strong enough, and often enough, as Goebbels said, people will believe it. And fifthly, he would rise and initiate world mission to the nations, dispossessing the gods. They're disempowered, now they are to be dispossessed. And when you pray for your national, state, and regional leaders, you have every right in the world to also at the same time pray against the evil spirits who seek to rule over us through godless leaders. He will return and destroy the Antichrist. He will cast the devil and the fallen gods into a pit. He will establish the everlasting kingdom of God, as I understand it, on earth as well as in the heavens. He will raise and judge the dead, rewarding the righteous. He will dwell amongst his redeemed people forever.